A warm welcome to the session. I'm Rashmi from Great HR and today's moderator of this session. So first of all, I would like to thank all of you to uh, join this session here, taking the time out of your busy schedule and for making it up to the session today. And to tell you what will be our discussion point today, it's all about understanding the labor law implications for employee and employer. So to discuss on the same, we have our experts in this session. Uh, but before that, let me take you all through how the session actually goes. Uh, so as you all know, our Pariche series have a couple of rounds uh, which are broken into a few minutes throughout uh, one hour session. So in first part of this session, we will be discussing uh, a few key points of the topic today, and then we will pitch into the audience Q&A. So that's when you can start putting across your questions in the Zoom control panel, the Q&A option. So we will be happy to take it up here and we'll try and get the answer from our experts, All right? So on this note, let's begin our today's session. Uh, well, to tell you all about uh, our uh, expert speakers today, we have uh, Mr. Rajesh Bansal, uh, who is uh, the retired edition Central PF Commissioner. Uh, we welcome you to today's session, sir, and we are honored to have you today here. I believe your knowledge and experience would add great value to our today's webinar. Thank you. Uh, our, uh, our next expert speaker is Mr. Adish Veer Singh, uh, the founder of Nidhi Niyojan. And to tell you more about uh, Mr. Adish, he's a consultative committee member of EPFO on automation and executive committee member of All India Organization of Employers, Fiki Arm. Sir, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Rashmi. And uh, moving on to our uh, uh, next speaker, Mr. Anurag Jain, uh, the co-founder partner of By the Book Consulting. Uh, welcome, Mr. Anurag, and thank you so much for joining us as a special moderator for today's session. Thanks, Rashmi. Thanks for having me. Uh, so, uh, dear attendees, without further ado, I'd, I would like to hand over the session to Mr. Anurag. Sir, please take it forward. So uh, thanks, uh, Rashmi, and uh, a very good evening uh, to all the participants. Uh, we hope this uh, session is useful and insightful for all of you. Uh, before we jump to the main part of the session, just a quick sort of like uh, introduction of Rajesh, sir. So besides being the ex-additional uh, Central Provident Fund Commissioner, he was uh, he's also a chartered accountant and an MBA. And uh, uh, one of his... Uh, uh, he played a very, very pivotal role uh, uh, in some of departments initiatives like uh, combining five, five chalans into one, uh, the creation of a new fund management system, as well as uh, uh, when uh, the payroll guys are filing their ECR. So uh, uh, we should be thankful to Rajesh uh, sir for his inputs and his uh, uh, lead through this entire initiatives. Uh, as far as regarding other G is concerned, uh, uh, we interacted when I uh, uh, when I was working for a big four organization, and he was from the client side. Now he has crossed over to the consultancy side, and uh, uh, he was uh, earlier working in HCL. HCL, as you might already be aware, has a pretty huge uh, corpus of uh, uh, PF trust. So uh, other sir uh, was playing again a very very important and a leading role in terms of managing the trust. Besides provident fund, he had also had exposure in uh, gratuity and superannuation as well. So uh, thanks, uh, uh, Rajesh sir and uh, uh, Adarji. Uh, very welcome, very warm welcome to this session. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Now, uh, we know we have a very limited time and the topics that we intend to cover today uh, is quite wide ranging. So what we have done is, uh, instead of uh, doing a normal reports wherein we always uh, play a slide deck and then we discuss around it, uh, we had made it a more kind of a uh, interactive session today when I would be posing some of the practical questions that organizations are facing, some of the questions that were posed to me uh, by my clients. So uh, we'll concentrate for 40, 45 minutes around these questions. These questions have also been uh, logically uh, divided into three parts. One is focusing on the upcoming code on social security. The second would focus on some aspect around a provident fund and social security agreement. And last but not the least, we'll uh, just have a quick round of discussion around the Provident Fund Trust as well. So this is how we have structured. Uh, 
beginning with the code on social security uh sir i and others we are aware that code on social security received a presidential assent on september 28 uh, 2020 and uh september 29th was when the official gazetted notification came into picture after that it is almost now uh two years now and we are yet to see uh, these codes coming into effect so the the first and, and a sort of like a million dollar question right now is when this code uh, on social security might come into effect we are reading news articles wherein they are saying okay july might be a date when when these codes might come into effect but we just wanted to understand your view or your personal view point around this and there's a second follow up question around this as well that if and when these codes come into effect uh, will they be in one go or will there be only selected sections which might come into effect yes sir so uh on the thanks for the question so thing is that we also are relying on uh two things basically one the media news that we are also expecting that the social security code is likely to be uh, implemented effective either 1st of july or 22 23 or 24th of july that we are relying on this thing and uh, as far as the implementation goes it is it also depends uh, majorly on how the states are ready with their respective uh, state laws which will be, which will be governing uh, the social security code as a majority of uh, the uh, the states have come up with the with their own respective uh, social security codes but the issue is that unless and until in totality this is uh, formulated by each and every state uh, then it, the the main issue will remain if it is not done you know the main issue will remain that about the mobility let us say uh, someone some by especially with the gig workers also coming in the ambit of law so let us say someone from west bengal comes to delhi or up for working here and when they come here the the regime is of social security state of social security whereas if flies they go back then it will be again will be the back you know that same epfo or esi or that type of law so the mobility will be the main issue here how to control it that's why all of the states they need to formulate their own state laws make this social security as a success story so i mean we are, we do expect that uh, by july everything will be in place and this uh, employee benefit schemes you know is get rolled out that's our uh, you know as we go regarding that and uh, as far as whether the next question comes that uh, whether all the social security laws around you know uh, industrial relations or wages and social security and then uh, you know occupational hazard whether they will go live uh, in one go or whether it will be staggered implementation so again our view is that uh, they will be doing live uh, in one go and it doesn't make any sense uh, you know that implementation gets uh, happen so again this inputs are based on our uh, understanding of uh, and uh, the discussion what we had in various uh, uh, forums that was uh, our uh, view on this so the, the the good question is that about 29 uh, labor laws are you know clubbed in these four uh, Uh, so the security codes and let's see you know how this happen though things are new uh, to india but definitely uh, they are more impactful and it will bring bring more professionals in the uh, for the employees as well as for them that needs to be seen yeah pansat sir your inputs on this yes i agree with the mr adarsh hmm. uh, because of the uh, objective of this social security code was universalization of labor laws and uh, social security benefit and when universalization there then the any employee working anywhere in india should he should be covered under the social security code so therefore until unless all the states are ready with the rules under this social security code it will be difficult to implement it in a scattered manner staggered manner in one state we are having social security code and in another state we are not having social security code it will not be there it will be implemented throughout india in one go okay so so uh, as a as a second follow up question to this boss uh, and this this is a question that is many many companies are asking that what will happen once the code comes into effect 
Uh, right now, if you look at specifically from the Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Provisions Act, there are three schemes. There is a Employee Provident Fund scheme, then there's a pension scheme, then we have EDLI scheme. What will happen to, uh, to these schemes? Although we know that there's a transitionary clause built in the labor codes, which says that once the code comes into effect, uh, these, these schemes will continue for a period of 12 months. But what will happen to these schemes after that? Will they continue or will there be a, 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 a sort of like any, any scheme which is being drafted uh, within the government uh, bodies? So definition definitely uh, is much wider if we compare the new social security law. Let us say uh, it becomes section two of the existing EPF Act. So in, in the EPF Act, uh, there's a, there's a uh, subject specifically for contributions. So now, you know, here in Section 2, the contributions are restricted to employees and employer contributions. But with the, with the introduction of uh, Section 221 in the Social Security Code, now this again goes a, a step further, whereas the employers are empowered to even cover the contract, contractual or contract employees also. And in case uh, the contract employees are, or the contractors are not complying with the, uh, with the, with the PF, so employers are now empowered to deduct that money from the running bills of the contractors. So the word what they what they specifically use in uh, chapter three is that uh, that empower that and empower any amount payable or on behalf of employee employee if any amount is payable that money can be recovered from the contractor's bill, right? Either on a bill or if any if there's any debt which has to be discharged that can be again set off. From, uh, from the uh, from the contractors bills earlier this this uh, particular subject was uh, you know not there or missing right and uh, so that way uh, there are there are these are the few you know things which uh, which, which are a uh, little bit different from what the existing uh, L, uh, EP effect is there versus uh, you know the contribution I would find there was one differentiator on contribution. Rest, uh, Mr. Bansal can add, and if apart from this, he thinks that uh, there's another things to be added. added yeah. nee, th that is true, but the thing is that, as Anurag is saying, that after 12 months of transition period, what will happen to this EPF and EDLI and pension scheme? I feel that the basic crux of the scheme will continue only thing is that there will be some changes or some amendments in the scheme, existing schemes, to meet out the requirements of the social security code. As uh, Mr. Darsh has also brought out that regarding the uh, right of employer to deduct the contributions paid on behalf of the contractor from the contractor bills. So, like this, if there are any things which are not in the existing schemes, EPF, EDL, and pension scheme, those things will be added in the schemes in the time to come. But the scheme, the main uh, crux will remain the same. Right. So, there will, from contributions, there will be change in uh, this definition also, which I think Rod will be covering in the later part of uh, the session. And uh, I also remember another thing is that apart from the, these three social security laws, what we are talking now, that is provident fund uh, and the three schemes there under. So, you know, this new social security law, there is a provision there that in case government thinks that some additional social security uh, law is required to be enacted so that government in itself is empowered to do it. So it doesn't require again, going back to parliament or seeking any approval there, but there by this, you know, appropriate authorities empowered therein to uh, promulgate another, uh, you know, social security scheme. That is the added, yes. uh, these two things I thought that uh, will further add, add to this. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, now coming on to the definition of the wages. Uh, uh, now we know that there's a uniform definition of wages, which is pretty much uniform across all the four labor codes. Uh, uh, it's, it's a pretty uh, complicated definition from a layman's perspective. And uh, so I have been receiving a lot of questions from companies which are saying that, okay, fine, we have gone through the 
definition of wages and we feel that if we put in our basic salary as 50% of wages then we are going to be compliant with this uh, particular definition is it the right notion that companies are having Hansan sir yes as uh, you can see from the definition of wages in the social security code it is not that the basic wages should be 50% hmm. it says the definition is of wages wages says that all remuneration whatever is there in kind or in cash whatever is there and it says that it includes basic pay dns allowance and retaining allowance if any but does not include and then exclusion clause is there it says that exclusions in the it says the exclusions cannot be more than 50% of the total remuneration hmm. so therefore this is not the correct interpretation that we should have basic pay equivalent to 50% of the total remuneration no it is not there it says that the wages definition is there wages means that all remuneration and but the deductions cannot be the exclusions cannot be more than 50% so therefore you can have i suppose you are paying uh, your total remuneration is 100 rupees so you can have 30% of the total remuneration as basic pay and another 20% as da or retaining allowance so basic pay can be less than 50% but other exclusions when you add it up that should not be more than 50% of the total remuneration so basic pay da basic pay you can have 30% or even whatever you want to have basic pay you can have it this is only to stop the uh, employers from reducing their pay in such a way that contributions to the provident fund are reduced so we have seen that in some of the cases the employers were structuring their pay in such a way that they are paying in total remuneration much more but the p for pf contributions they were having only 20 or 30% of the total remuneration so in order to avoid that it has been put that 50% of the total remission cannot be excluded more than 50% mm-hmm. cannot be in the excluded category if it is more than 50% of the excluded category then that will be ignored and wages will be the 50% of total remission and sir keeping check on uh, basic wages or uh, because this is going to impact your gratuity payment also because yes. gratuity payment is uh, calculated on the basic pay so i mean that way if uh, the say you had uh, you know the basic uh, can be 30% mm. of total ctc so that by that uh, the net uh, gratuity outflow will also be uh, checked that way yes then there is an interesting question uh, bansat sir and adarsh ji that is uh, we uh, if you recall there was a supreme court landmark judgment which again was based on other supreme court landmark judgments as well uh, i remember uh, i think it was vivekanand vidya mandir ruling uh which basically define the term wages and what all encompasses uh, what all components are to be included now there is an interesting question which which companies are pondering over what will happen to that particular ruling of course we have a new legislation but what will be the impact of that ruling do we have to read the new definition of wages along with that ruling and see what will be the outcome or is it something totally different that because there is a new legislation uh there is no requirement to look at the past ruling then then we move forward and see what kind of a clarity is being brought about by the government as well as the judicial uh, uh, authorities okay. as far as i feel that since those judgments were there when the social security code was not there hmm. and the definition of wages was given in the different social security enactments like in epf esi other uh, acts definitions were given so the supreme court in those judgments 
has interpreted or given their judgment on the basis of the definition of wages as per uh, as available in those times in those hmm. acts hmm. now since the social security code has come into being the definition of wages given in this social security code will be implemented and will be uh, the will be subject to any court interpretation but that interpretation of the social security uh, the, uh, wages given in the supreme court judgments i don't think that will be applicable now in the present circumstances no yeah. doubt it will get some uh, leads from those judgments mm -hmm. yes okay so uh, anurag thing thing about uh, definition of employees so defined the social security law oh. it says that employee means employee drawing less or equal than the minimum wage ceiling hmm. right so we are talking about currently we are talking about employees in the under social falling under social security who are drawing less than or equal than 15000 rupees as a uh, you know basic pay current hmm. current so this is not increased but here also i think so um, our personal view is that this uh, this is going to be revised very shortly the reason being that otherwise there will be two conflicting laws uh, within uh, within pf and EL, uh, epf eps there will be two, two conflict things because in eps it it says that employee can contribute higher than the the the, 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 the minimum ceiling for drawing more uh, you know pension there are to the maximum threshold of 15000 rupees only hmm. so this uh, i think so there are a lot of conflicts that will come when the practicality it comes uh, for implementation is our personal view on this yeah so another another practical problem uh, uh, which is coming up is on account of uh, components like variable bonus and then there are some one time components like retention or loyalty bonus or notice pay which is being paid by organizations now if you look at uh, the definition of wages and the exclusion criteria they talk about bonuses which are payable under the respective legislations uh, so uh, what is the thought process around variable bonuses and such one time components will will this be categorically included under the inclusion criteria or is there any any clause within the exclusion criteria wherein we can bucket it into and say okay fine these components can come under exclusion criteria i don't think that uh, whatever voluntary you are paying as a notice pay or whatever is there which is the bonus hmm. joining bonus all those things will never be in this uh, social security code definition of wages hmm. it will not be excluded it will be a part of the wages okay even one time payments even one time payments okay yeah and what about so uh, again if we look at the definition of wages and the reason we are deliberating so much on wages is because this is the number one concern of uh, uh, most of the companies and uh, there's one more component which they have quoted in the definition of wages which talks about remuneration in kind these are those components which are paid or uh, facilities being provided by an organization be it in terms of providing equity stock options or be it in terms of providing any benefits or facility which are non monetary by nature so now the question comes up if there are such facilities benefits which are being provided by organization what will be the valuation criteria for it because if you look closely at the actual legislation uh, we have looked at the draft rules as well which has been circulated the draft central rules uh, they have no way mentioned uh, what will be the valuation criteria for such benefits so the only recourse or alternate recourse available with us is in terms of taking guidance from the rule 3 of the income tax rules or is there any other uh, valuation criteria that uh, one should consider since uh, this emoluments or anything paid in kind it is included in the wages definition and there is no mention about how these will be valued in the social security code so i feel that as of now hmm. till uh, government comes with any other uh, clarification on this issue till then the rules provided on the under the income tax law it will be safer for the employers to follow those for valuation of 
those mm. perks or those benefits. Yeah. And moreover, apart from uh, this, tax life is definitely going to increase multifold. The reason being in both the regimes where, you know, the contributions are going to increase for employees post, uh, because once uh, the recovery of PF is more, so two and a half lakh threshold process for majority of employees, whereas uh, as of now, the population will be very minuscule. But with this implementation, you know, this two and a half lakh limit will be very easily, a lot of employees will be falling under this. And not only this, uh, part only even the employer contribution of seven and a half lakh rupees, the tax liability is going to increase for individual employees. Hmm. So that also needs to be, you know, considered uh, this uh, revised uh, social security regime. Right, right. And in terms of the gratuity, uh, now we are moving away from the definition of wages, but then there is an immediate fallout on a, and th that's a big and substantial hit uh, in terms of the cost for the employer is on account of gratuity. Now, the formula for the gratuity remains the same. It is 15 days salary for every completed aid of service. Right now, it is multiplied by the uh, factor of basic wages, but now the, uh, it will be basically replaced by the new definition of wages. And also there is no grandfathering clause which has been built in. So now the organizations are sitting, once the social security code comes into picture, there's going to be a massive impact on account of such one-time gratuity payments. Is there any way, is there any alternative again within the four corners of the law via which companies or the organizations can mitigate this impact? Yeah, of course, you know, restructuring is definitely required for the, uh, for the salary, you know which falls under the uh, definition of wages in this case. Otherwise, you know, if you see that the definition of wages is very, very wider now, and it definitely has, uh, you know, financial impact uh, on uh, fixed um, uh, employment as well as on the expats. Mm -hmm. like, because earlier the expats and uh, fixed term employees uh, well, were not covered here, but with the mm -hmm. end of this uh, impact, you know, uh, not only uh, that, you know, with the, because uh, employers have to uh, go in for the insurance cover or they have to spend additional money either to fund it in case they were only provisioning it, that provision cost, uh, though it is there, but it's backed with the insurance cover. That is one. And if companies want to fund, they can also fund this uh, and the, the outcome, outgo of the gratuity is definitely going to increase because of the, the way I explained over a fixed term employer, uh, employment and uh, experts are covered. Though the five year criteria is there, but the uh, pro rata amount is uh, required to be paid under the revirement. Uh, you know, so, this is how it is. Does you want to add on something on this? Yes. Yes, because of uh, the definition of wages, it is going to affect financially under the gratuity. Because, as you have rightly said, that uh, until unless the pay structure is changed, modified, the existing pay structure will give adverse effect on the pay payout of gratuity. So, to cover that, the, either the structure is modified and simultaneously the payouts can be managed by either having our own gratuity provision for payout or the insurance. Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting point uh, Bansan said that you have mentioned regarding insurance provision. So right now, uh, majority of the organization go in for the provisioning of the gratuity, which is they create a provision in their books and once an employee leaves, then there is an actual payout which happens. If you look at the present payment of gratuity act, there is a compulsory insurance clause, which says that organizations either have to take a compulsory insurance or they create their approved gratuity trust. And then that gratuity trust creates a, a insurance uh, with, with the IRDA authorized uh, providers. Uh, if we look at code on social security, they have sort of like replicated that exact clause on compulsory insurance. Organizations are wondering, whether with the code on social security coming to picture, whether there will be a mandatory requirement to now get a compulsory insurance. And this is typical for those organizations who have up till now have been creating a provision in their books. Will there be a requirement on them to create a compulsory insurance? Yes. And not only for uh, on-roll employees, for contractual employees as well. 
Hmm. Earlier, the perpetual employees were not required to be provisioned in the in the books of the company. But here, with a wider definition, you know, the provision includes the perpetual contractual employees as well. But then the question comes up. What what role will the state play? Because under the existing Payment of Gratuity Act, it is only the state of Andhra Pradesh which have in their state rules prescribed compulsory insurance for companies. Yeah. Uh, uh, right now, no other state have prescribed. If we talk about code on social security, will a similar sort of like arrangement would be there? There wherein we would need to wait and see uh, what the state rules will be. Uh, yeah. uh, applicable and then whether an organization will need to go and see whether a compulsory insurance is required or not. Correct. Correct. Yeah. On, you know, what, how does uh, our states you know, behave and how they uh, they provide for this graduate? Of course. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think we can move on to the next session, keeping in view the positive of the time. Uh, the next topic we will focus on is uh, more around certain aspects around provident fund, some aspects around international workers and the social security agreement. Starting with a with a very really broad topic, we have been hearing in news that uh, that fifteen thousand prescribed cap limit might be enhanced to uh, twenty one thousand. There's also talks about reducing the threshold limit, the mandatory threshold limit of coverage of establishment from the twenty employees to ten. Uh, what kind of a impact uh, are you guys seeing on the organization? Will it lead to an increased salary burden on the organization? Certainly, it will increase burden on those establishments which are as of now not covered because of the number of employee strength below 20. Hmm. Those establishments, if the threshold limit is reduced to 10 employees for coverage under the social security, that is particularly EPF, then those establishments will have some financial burden on the part of, on because of this EPF contribution. Hmm. And uh, similarly, if the threshold limit of 15,000 is raised for an employee to become member of the EPFO, if it is raised from 15,000 to 21,000 or 25,000, then certainly it will have impact for those employees who are having these number of employees, these employees who are getting salary of 15,000 and 25,000 in between. But since as of now, generally we are talking about <laughs> CTC. So new employees, the employer can manage for this financial burden in the CTC by restructuring their pay. So I don't think that it will have much impact on the existing establishments who are already covered under the EPF Act. And who are in the CTC model. Yes. Yes. Here, you know, what we further see is that government uh, cost is also going to increase there. Because government has to uh, fund the EPS scheme also. Government con contributes 1.16%. Mm -hmm. Regional employees uh, contributions to this. Will have impact on government. This will certainly have the impact if we reduce from the number of employees strength from 20 to 10. It will automatically cover number of establishments under the EPF. And I personally feel that it will be there even if it will have impact on the government budget because. Now, social security is saying that it will be universal. Unorganized sector is below 10. And you are covering under the EPF who are having more than 20. So what, the establishment which are implying 10 to 20 employees, they are nowhere. So in order to cover them, this threshold limit of 20 to 10 will be, you now I think it will be there. I don't know when the government will decide on this. And for 15,000 to 25,000 wages, if it is increased, yes, it is again going to have financial burden on the government because government is to contribute towards pension scheme. So I don't know. Government may decide that, okay, 
for threshold limit is raised from 15000 to 25000 for the pf scheme but under the pension scheme it will remain at 15000 to avoid any further uh, burden financial burden on the government question here, yeah yeah the question here additional supplementary question here is that government is uh, thinking of increasing the existing pension because the pension what employees are trying now is a very minuscule maybe 2500 if you take even take the average the people who have retired now they are not getting more than 3000 rupees as a pension and that is true that is true so i mean just to increase that another thing is going on that they want it is the pension kitty also of the employees so that in future also whensoever employee retires they, they should at least get 50 percent of the basic pay what they were drawing last so they were thinking on, on those lines so if they are going they were thinking of increasing the pension that definitely the threshold should go up or it has to go up otherwise with the 15,000 or 25,000 they will not be able to manage that type of uh, you know higher pension in this case Yes, yes, it depends upon the government's uh, thinking because the, as of now, the EPF was or the ESIC was introduced only to help the low paid employees. Mm -hmm. So, social security was to be provided to the employees who are not in a position to have their own retirement as, uh, provisions. Yeah. Highly paid employees can have their own uh, provisions by saving some other uh, way. Mm -hmm. But for compulsory yeah. social security was only for the low paid employees. Yeah. As for that matter, only it was uh, restricted up to 15,000 or earlier it was 6,500. Mm -hmm. So for them, uh, 2,500 or 3,000 pension, it may sound very minuscule for we people. But if to a laborer or to a person of a weaker section, it is a good money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, but nowadays, 2,500, 3,000, nothing. Yeah. But existing pension scheme itself provides for 50% of the wages as a pension. If you serve uh, up to 32 years or 33 years continuously and your contribution is there in the UPS scheme, you will get 50% of your uh, last uh, years uh, 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 wages, basic wages on which you have contributed. Yeah, had you been, had you been contributed on the actual basic? Yeah, actual basic, uh, f again, uh, we are saying that for those employees who are getting more than 15,000. Yeah, yeah, correct. Uh, for f my personal, yeah. uh, my personal view is that EPF scheme or pension scheme was not for those who are getting higher salary because government will contribute only to the low paid employees. Mm. 116 percent government from budget will help to the persons who are in need of that money. Yeah, yeah. Not for that person who is uh, getting 2 lakh of his salary and on 2 lakh uh, government will contribute. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah, Subsidy will be given to the person who need it. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. So moving on from the local employees to rather international workers, uh, uh, we know that there are 18 social security agreements which have been uh, put into effect. Uh, but two major countries, US and UK, are still alluding. I mean, we have heard in media that uh, some past conversation has happened, but nothing fruitful has materialized. Uh, now with the code on social security and the emphasis on universalization, and portability and all those benefits being provided to both organized as well as unorganized workers. Do you foresee that uh, both these countries will come on the table, have those discussions in an effective agreement will come into place? Yes, uh, I, uh, I, I was there when uh, some initial uh, meetings were there with the US uh, uh, counterparts on this social security agreement. Basically, the thing is that this is only possible when it is good for citizens of both the countries. Now, as of date, India's population, which is working in US or UK, is much more than the UK or US population working in India. So, 
we are contributing to their social security schemes in us or uk but as per their laws we are not in a position to get benefits under the social security scheme because they say that for 8 years if you contribute only then you are eligible for social security benefits but visa they will give work visa only less than those 8 years i am simply giving an example so therefore we are our population is contributing to their social security schemes and making them rich without hmm. getting any benefits hmm. so therefore till we are in a position that india is also getting us uk population working in india then it will be a better bargaining position for us also hmm. but on the table they were not saying all these things they were simply putting this that since in india social security is not universal it is not applicable to everybody so therefore they were saying that till that is there we will not be in a position to consider this social security agreements i think now india can bargain with them that now since the social security code has come into being it is applicable to the unorganized sector organized sector also so but even then we will not be in a position to have those social security agreements till it is uh, balanced with the working population of india there and their work person working in india so it is basically millions of indians working in us uk versus few thousand working in india Oh. Yes, that is the main problem. Yeah, that's the main problem. But uh, another uh, interesting thing is that because for US and UK citizens, they are being penalized in India. What happens is that the PF is deducted on the gross salary, right? Oh. Pension is contributed as eight point three three percent of the actual basic. Uh, sorry, actual uh, gross oh. is contributed there. But when this international workers, you know, coming from US, US or UK, so when they go for withdrawal of this money, pension money. This is forfeited by government of India. Right, right. They, mm. they don't get. They only get PF and that too when mm. they are eight years old. Mm. Basically, because I had a practical experience, you know, where US and UK citizens who were working in a in one of the organization where I had worked. So you know, they made a lot of human cry. They went to uh, even embassies also, and they are to their respective country also. They represented through the Ministry of External Affairs, but nothing has happened. The government is very clean. Indian government is very clean. They are not about that. So you give us equal rights. We are otherwise your 401k. Right? There's a social security in US. So that way, you know, we will also not be able to pay you if you come. You don't come on a bargain. That, that, that is absolutely uh, true. And when our Indians were asking for this social security benefit in the US. they were saying the same things to our people yeah absolutely so uh, now when india has started the same thing that we will <laughs> forfeit your money without giving any benefits so no oh. let us see that because of all these pressure tactics or whatever is there we have some uh, social security agreements with them also hmm. some other form yeah, yeah. So, sir, in terms of uh, when we are speaking about US and UK, there's a there's a large contingent of population, and now we are jumping about to the countries with which India has social security agreements. There's a large set of population who are going outside India to such SSC countries. Normally, they take a COC or uh, what we call that the availability detachment benefit, and then they are not required to contribute towards the host country social security scheme. In few countries' cases, it has been seen that if they don't avail their social security scheme then they might be at a loss in terms of not getting health benefits or in terms of schooling benefits for their children so the the, the pertinent question which is coming into picture is when when such an arrangement comes into picture when employees are eligible to obtain coc is it something which is mandatory on them let's suppose if they don't do it they don't avail the benefit of coc and then they contribute towards the overseas social security scheme and get their benefit is it something which is uh, the the true spirit of the social security agreements at the same time what whatever legislation has been uh, provided in the uh, employees provided fund scheme for international workers 
Mr. Bansal, I think so. He has uh, gone on mute. Uh, so he might be coming. Uh, Adil sir, you can contribute. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, what happens is there is an enabling provision, not in the act, but in the scheme. Hmm. So Mr. Bansal is there. Sir, I would like you to answer. Uh, sir, you are on mute. You are on mute, sir. Ah. Hmm. Uh. The thing is that this uh, the spirit of the social security agreements or all those uh, intention workers provision in the EPF scheme or was to avoid double contribution of social security in the host country as well as in the home country. For that matter, social security agreements were entered into, and the certificate of coverage system was introduced. So, in my view, if any employee or end employer feels that certificate of coverage is beneficial for them when they are going to a country with which we are having social security agreement, they can have certificate of coverage. But if they feel that it will not be financially beneficial to them for having certificate of coverage, then they can opt out of this. But as of now, in the provisions as exists, sometimes it is interpreted that it is not optional. It has to be taken, certificate of has to be taken. Correct. But even then, in my view, we can go for either certificate of coverage or we can go without certificate of coverage. But I am having a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit different uh, view on this uh, with all due respect. So, sir, what happens is that in the act, there, 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 there wasn't any change in the act, right? It's only the scheme which was changed. So, like, there was para 83 which was introduced into EPS scheme. So, if you typically go with the existing definition also, it states that uh, if the employee is becoming eligible for getting the benefit, so in that case, employee has to fill. Otherwise, this particular employee has to uh, make dual contributions. Being in uh, posted in a social security country, in home and as a host country, the employees have to contribute towards the provident fund. This is if we go to the clarificatory uh, circular which was issued by uh, EPFO head office uh, in 2016. So you know there there is a tabular form is there. If, if you see the preface of it, it says that if any wages are paid by Indian establishment from the Indian books, only then it is applicable, right? And then in the table, and if you go to the second page of that particular table, it says that uh, if no salary and wages is pay, paid or payable in India, then COC is not required and an employee has to contribute into uh, host country social security. Now, you know, there are two conflicting versions here. Because of that, what happens is that EPFO, the, uh, the regional commissioner's office and inspectors or the enforcement officers, they come and then they quote the provision of the law itself, right? And then they insist on that, no, you have to obtain a COC irrespective and uh, you have to have, uh, these employees should contribute to Indian PF in any case. So what our view is that if there is a conflict in the in the circular, or if there is a conflict in the in the definition which is provided under uh, Para 83, then EPFO definitely uh, should come up with a more clarification on this particular aspect. And this particular aspect I am talk talking about is not only restricted to uh, the uh, various voices which uh, employers have been uh, giving to uh, EPFO, either, wow. in, either through Chamber of Commerce or through NASCOM. But this uh, verification is not still not so, so still there is a uh, there is a lot of gap in this particular area. What to do? What not to do? The safest way from our side is that uh, that uh, take um, uh, COC irrespective. Okay. Yes. Uh, for a safer side, you can go ahead like this. Yeah. But the thing is that uh, no doubt clarification should be issued on these topics by the EPFO yeah. for uh, guidance to the employer as well as employees. Yes. But even then, 
uh, others, as you are telling that some of the original offices, some of the inspectors are saying like this, that they should be uh, deposited, the fee of contribution deposited in India. All those things will remain, even uh, hundreds of clarifications are issued. <laughs> those things will be remain there. The yeah. thing is that when you, how, who is an employee? Who is an employee? We have to, first of all, establish it under the EPF Act. Only yes. then we can ask for the contributions. When you are not paying anything in your books of accounts, so how he can be treated as an employee? So all those things are there. So this is a matter of interpretation by the individual. Therefore, I am saying that even any clarification issued by the EPFO from head office, even then somebody will be there for uh, interpreting in some other way. Yeah. So I am specifically So my, my only situation is that we have to see the whole provisions in one go. Yeah. Then we can decide whether it should be uh, taken as COC. But on a safer side, yes, COC is uh, the best option. Uh, sir, I was actually specifically referring to uh, to a case where no wages are paid or payable in India. So it is a subsidiary which is uh, which is at on site, and they only discuss that uh, subsidiary of Indian company only. So they pay uh, from their pocket. All expenses are borne by that particular subsidiary only. And nothing is paid in India. Yes. This is all uh, interpretation for each effects of the case, individual cases. Yeah. That cannot be discussed in, in detail. Yes. But yes. The, uh, we can simply generally say that, okay, as far as uh, COC is concerned, that is the best uh, option. Nobody will uh, question the same Absolutely. afterwards. Yeah. Yes. So, so we have uh, now three minutes left, but uh, of course we can extend for uh, another five, ten minutes. And I'm just quickly jumping onto the Provident Fund Trust portion because I'm sure there are uh, participants from organizations who might be having a private Provident Fund Trust. Now, in the past couple of years, we have seen uh, that the administration cost vis-a-vis -vis the inspection charges have uh, reduced considerably and so that cost and arbitrage opportunities for the trust has reduced. Uh, we are also seeing uh, uh, many organizations now opting for closing their provident fund trust and getting the corpus transferred to EPO4. Uh, uh, question to you, Adarshji, that besides this admin cost region, uh, reasons, what could be the other reasons driving these organizations to close their trust and transfer their corpus to uh, EPO4? Correct. So, Anwar, uh, my personal experience here is that uh, where you know the corpus of the trust is maybe less than 500 crores, those type of trusts they should definitely think of exiting and surrendering their trust. Reason being that one, there is a challenge on finding good investment papers uh, in the market. Usually, what happens that uh, if you go to market, you the market lot of investment is of five crore rupees. If your monthly contributions are less than five crore rupees, you then have to optimize on the cost as well as the quality of the paper in which you are investing. Second thing is that uh, the earlier when the, the trust was formed, the basic crux was that the services of EPFO were not that good. Mm -hmm. And here, the government of trust, you know, it always uh, was a prerogative of the company to give better service to employees, right? Now, as if, as as the you know, EFO as if as on more and more into automation mode, so the services definitely are better. That is the second aspect. The third aspect is that being a trust, you have to file you know a lot of compliances. You have to report to PF office, and as a unexempted establishment or where you don't have a trust, you know, ECR is the only one thing which you have to file, right? And you need not to go through any uh, further inspections and that type of thing is nothing you're not going to face it so you are more comfortable uh, as far as uh, you know going to epfo as compared to having their own trust then uh, another thing is that nowadays we have seen that a uh, lot of companies lot of investments have gone bad for example ILA has gone bad most of our trust have a closure in ILA because they were triple a at that time and they were giving very good returns like Many trusts are having exposure in ILFS, DHFL, even for that purpose, PSIDC. Though the papers were secured, but still, you know, people lost in that. Now, again, if you are having a trust, this is for the defunct papers, 
there is onus and responsibilities of employer only to make good that loss right you cannot adjust from your reserves and surpluses so you know considering all those things it is always good for the trust to surrender but the trust you know which are reasonable in size they still may you know continue but uh, my prudent advice to is that if the trust is of less than 500 crore rupees they should immediately you know think of surrendering it right uh bansar sir any input from your end no as far as i am concerned from the very beginning i was of the view that the trust should not be there itself you should not have their own trust but as of now there was no uh, nothing is for exempted trust left as you have rightly said that arbitrage of inspection and admission charges are now very less as compared to earlier years and similarly because of the bad papers and the one the most thing is that since now private investments are also allowed in the epf trust some of the employers have gone for those private equity and which has gone defunct so the burden on the employer is much more now so it will be better if as adarsh is also telling that the small trust small trust means less than 500 crore rupees they should better think of surrendering their exemption and the services part of the epfo has improved a lot and mm -hmm. there is now settlement of epf claims uh, very quickly and online and everything is now on the tips of the employers and employees so therefore it is better if those smarters surrender their exemption so uh, if you see uh, past couple of years uh, i think couple of years back there was this amendment which was brought about in the tax legislation which allowed uh, trust to transfer their corpus to nps there was a one time exemption which was granted this was for first and foremost the provident fund and second for superannuation now superannuation there is no separate legislation so it used to get covered under the income tax legislation and there was a circular which was issued by pfrd which basically mentioned how superannuation corpus can be transferred to nps uh, what about provident fund we haven't seen any enabling provision uh, under the epf act which allows companies to transfer their corpus to schemes like nps is it something which could be there in the future or is it something which is a sort I, of like close check I, i i don't know the thing is that simultaneously there should be provision also for transfer from nps to epfo <laughs> right <laughs> so wherever uh, the employee if employee is uh, having an option from uh, epfo to go to nps then mm. there should also be provision from nps to epfo Mm -hmm. so i think that uh, in future there may be some provision like this also yeah yeah so not currently there is no such provision for no, no. yes 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 so again there is an interesting question because as we were talking about the fall in the value of the investments uh, uh companies are now thinking of course all these trusts might be having a substantial reserves and surplus now they are considering uh whether they can utilize this reserves for two fold objective one is to meet the statutory rate of interest the other is because of the fall in the value of the investments or whatever losses might have incurred can they utilize these reserves and surplus that is a big question that is coming from many companies the, yeah. the reserve and surplus is which is available in the exempted trust that reserve and surplus is must be from the interest earned by the trust and the interest paid by the trust to the pf subscribers hmm. so that reserves cannot be utilized for any losses in the investments for that there is a specific provision that if any investments are lost that has to be recouped by the employer specific provision is there so you cannot use that reserve and surplus which is surplus of the past interest you cannot use that for recouping the loss 
incurred due to loss of investments the second thing is that if you are not in a position to use that money for recouping the loss on the investments then for what other purpose you will be able to use it since that is the surplus interest of the earlier years you can utilize it for payment of interest during the current year that is earned surplus because that is earned surplus is a cushion when you are earning more you are saving when you are not earning enough to meet the interest rate or the epfo then you can utilize that money for uh, meeting that interest rate of the epfo so i'm not there are specific provisions of 77a and this is sub para 6 and sub para 28 we specifically you know talk about uh, what mr bansal was explaining and then there is a circular also issued by uh, head of it that where the investments have gone bad just because uh, there was a uh, there was a degrading of the investment category or it was uh, it is not listed now and uh, where the value has gone zero just because that company has filed for a bankruptcy in that case it is onus of complete onus of employer to make good that so reserves can cannot be utilized in any case uh, pay of trust uh, reserves i'm talking about for making good the losses to the trust right right uh so i i think we are now not left with uh, much time so i'm just going to ask the last question for the day uh during this entire transition process of the pf trust to the before we keep hearing about this blackout period uh what exactly is this period all about and is there any way in which the companies who are transitioning their corpus they can basically avoid this blackout period you are talking about the transition period when any exempted trust is surrendering their exemption yeah. and transferring the money to the epfo hmm. uh the thing is that whenever any employer or establishment wants to surrender their exemption they have to apply to the epfo given application and then they are to give some date suppose they have given a date 1st of july of any particular year then after that 1st of july the pf contributions are to be paid by the employer or establishment to the epfo hmm. simultaneously they are also to transfer past accumulations as on 30th, 30th of june and along with the detail of the employees their balances and also the securities whatever is there definitely it will take 2 3 months time to transfer all those things and to reconcile the same during that 2 3 months of period the epfo will not be able to settle the pf claims or advances to the subscribers to the members of that trust because the money is not available with the epfo not the details are available similarly mm -hmm. the establishment will also not be able to the trust will also not be able to pay anything since mm. they have now closed and they have given uh, their date to the mm. pfo so during those 2 3 months absolutely the employee will not be able to get those benefits however since the employer is going to give an application for surrender of exemption they have decided then they must also take into confidence all those workers there whoever is in need of money they should settle their claims or give them advances whatever is there before the date of uh, surrendering otherwise they will have to suffer for 2 3 months the transition period that is uh, you are uh, talking about a blackout period yeah it cannot yeah. be avoided because another entity new ledger is in the epf for record so there is no transition period it is considered as a no transition period yes okay so uh, i think that would be all we are already past uh, our timeline uh, thanks uh, uh, bansal sir and adar ji uh, for chatting and basically providing your input useful inputs i hope uh, the audience have uh, basically benefited from from this useful knowledge sharing session uh, because we were uh, uh, basically within the time limit so 
uh, side by side, I was also responding to many of the queries of the participants. So in case the participants have any any further queries, uh, uh, I think Rashmi is going to take over and just uh, let them know how they can post their queries and uh, we would be happy to help them Yeah. after this session. Thanks, Rashmi. Over to you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anurag. Uh, so I must say it was a wonderful discussion uh, here. Uh, so dear attendees, if any of your questions are unanswered, please don't be disappointed. As you can already see, we are running short of time. That is the only reason we may not be able to take up all your questions, mm -hmm. but definitely your questions will be answered from Great HR. Uh, so here is the way you can already see on the screen. Uh, we have this community called Great Right. Uh, so basically this is a knowledge share uh, platform uh, where uh, you can post your questions and um, many industry experts are already part of this where they will be answering your questions and not just the experts but also the other HR peers are part of it so you can expect the responses from them as well so here is the link for the great right community please feel free to sign up and be a part of this wonderful community so on this note I think it's now time to conclude the session uh, but before that uh, if any of you have missed any part of today's session, do not worry because the session is recorded completely and the recording will be shared with all of you soon. All right. So any further queries, please feel free to write back to us on the given mail ID that is sharmishta at the rate of gradip.com. So on this note, I'm going to end the uh, session and also sir, Mr. Adesh sir, uh, Mr. Bansal and Mr. Anurag, thank you so much for your uh, 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 contributions here. I'm sure our attendees have found it very helpful and informative and we'll be looking forward to see you in our upcoming sessions. Till then, stay safe, take care, have a great time. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Ashwin. Bye. Thank you. Bye.